Hello and welcome to the Manchester is Red podcast. My name is Stephen Rilston and we're recording this episode on a very wet Wednesday afternoon here in Manchester and I'm joined by my colleague Samuel Lucas. Samuel, how are you? I'm not bad, not bad, thank you very much. Yourself? Is it, yeah, I mean, apart from the weather, is it chucking it down where you are? You're in it the is, of the woods. it is, of course, yeah. yes. You've just been at the press conference, of course, uh, United have a game against Chelsea tomorrow evening. Um, if I was married, Samuel, I'd probably say I'm seeing you more than my wife at the moment, but I'm not, so uh, I'll, not, I'll not make that comment. But we are seeing a lot of each other. We're travelling down to Stamford Bridge uh, tomorrow afternoon, another long journey. So we'll look ahead to that game a bit later in the podcast. But to begin with, we'll just have a little bit of housekeeping because there has been a few um, advancements. So United obviously approached Southampton for Jason Willicks in the technical for the technical director. Willicks? Wilcox. Jason Wilcox. Wilcox. I mean, we'll not say who I was watching last night, which is um, <laughs> influenced my pronunciation there. But would you like to expand on that line to start the podcast, Samuel? I, I don't think Manchester United will be signing any of the Willett brothers, <laughs> having uh, had one of them in their academy a few years ago. Uh, but that that was that, that emerged, what, Easter Monday evening, I think, wasn't it, that there'd, there'd been an official approach. It emerged... Might have been during Southampton's game at Ipswich Town, which ended in. Um, I mean, I tuned in for the second half, there, which I was quite glad about, given that it was quite quite the exciting finale with uh, Kieran McKenna and Lee Grant. Ipswich getting a ninety seventh minute uh, winner. They're they're still are they still top of the championship? I think they're having a hell yeah. of a season. But getting onto Southampton, who are or, or were competing for one of those automatic places. I mean, it was reported back in February that. United want Jason Wilcox as their technical director on the recommendation of Omar Barada, who, of course, is familiar with him, uh, having worked with him at Manchester City, where Wilcox was the, the, the director of the academy before he moved to Southampton in the summer to become their director of football. He still is at Southampton. I don't think he'll be at Southampton for much longer. United have offered a, a compensation package uh, equivalent of one year's salary, which apparently is a, one year of Wilcox's salary, which is roughly around £500,000. Southampton want more. And so they'll eventually there will be a... Um, a, a resolution, as, as there will be, no doubt, with, with Dan Ashworth, who's already on gardening leave. I think with, with Wilcox, he could he could feasibly start before Ashworth. And then it, the, the next question is, what's what's his role specifically going to consist of? Because he's, he's really kind of gone to a more senior role at Southampton as the director of football, and he had a he had a huge say in the choice of Russell Martin as manager last year at City. He was, he, he, you know, his niche was overseeing the academy, and that was very successful. Uh, given that City have been very, very good at youth level for a number of years, but the most impressive aspect of City's academy has been the the cash cow we've become and the remarkable fees they've generated for players who. We're never going to get anywhere near the first team. Never got anywhere near the first team. And in the case of James Trafford, who had never even played in the Championship, they still managed to obtain a fee of twenty million pounds from Burnley for him in the summer. So, if you with with the academy, you have to use it in different ways. Of course, the the main priority is, is to service the first team and to provide players who are going to make that leap from from the academy to the senior side and establish themselves. It's it's only always going to be a small percentage that do that because that's just the way it works in football. But United are quite rightly renowned for the young players they produce. But one of the big sticking points of the academy is that it has not been a cash cow. The United Academy, dating back to Sir Matt Busby's era, has produced brilliant players. It's produced very good players for other clubs as well over the years but they've always struggled to get good fees for them and in certainly in this era of profitability and sustainability rules of financial fair play it is very much in their interest to start getting their money's worth for players who could um, or, or should go on and have to, to have good careers elsewhere they were in an invidious position with Ted and Mengi in that he had two or three really bad injuries that had set him back it came to the point where he had to go. But now, where he's a Premier League regular at Luton 
and he's an Indian up to 21 international. His valuation, all part figure, it's got to be £10 million just for those two reasons. And United gave him away for crisps and little twigs or a ready meal or whatever it was uh, with the minimal fee. We, we know when it's not a lot of money because United declined to declare how much money the buying club has paid for him. And I'm, I'm not surprised that Mengi has actually done as well as he has at Luton because he did have very good potential in the United youth team and he was involved in around the first team midway through 2020 and he, he trained a lot with them. He had he got good loans to good clubs in the championship. And it's just a shame that he he had two or three really bad injuries that set him back. He got injured on during the uh, winter training camp thing he did last season. And of course, that's that your resale value is going to plummet. But now United look they look like mugs because he's played as regularly as he has at Luton. And he's, he's got into the England under 21 squad. And I don't think many people would have foreseen that. And people at United will rightly be proud of how well Mengi has done so quickly after leaving the club. He's a boyhood United fan. He was born in Manchester. He, he is a great story. But people, the new power brokers, will also rightly have to ask the question, why Why did you give him away for such a, such a frugal fee? And whatever Luton paid for him it's been an absolute bargain even with James Garner when he left did United get their money their, their money's worth for a player who was one of Forest's best best players in the season that they got the most back to the Premier League who is is a very accomplished player for Everton now is, is clearly Premier League quality and th- there were conflicting fees reported on on that as well from, from both sides when he did join Everton on deadline day but the fact he left on deadline day also highlighted the problem and that uh, okay Ten Hag wanted to have a look at him and then judge but the way it was handled was was pretty badly handled I mean I, I remember being told at the time that um, United had put the word out that they were looking for buyers before they'd actually told the player that he was going to be available for sale and certainly at the start of that summer I don't think there were very many United fans who thought that he would be leaving because his, his stock was high he'd done brilliantly in the Championship and they were hoping to see him start for United but if if he's going to, if a player is going to be served us to requirements you've got to be certain at the start of the summer and that's not been the case with United in, in recent years not just with Academy players and there's another example Jesse Lingard in 2021 different kind of issue there in terms of an academy player because he'd been in the first team or in the first team squad for six, six, seven years. But there was a willing buyer in West Ham who'd had him on loan. They'd set money aside to sign Jesse Lingard and then you've got the indecisiveness of Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Oh, he looks quite good. Do I want to keep him? Do I want to sell him? They don't sell him. Then they don't play him and then they miss out on a big fee and he's released in the summer. So they can't go down that route again. They've they've got to they have got to have an overhaul of, of that department just in terms of uh, treating the academy as a cash cow. And obviously Wilcox is experienced uh, from that uh, at that from his time at City. In terms of what actually happens with Darren Fletcher then Samuel, I mean he is the current technical director. He was the first ever technical director that was appointed at the club along when John Murta was appointed as football director in twenty twenty one, the March of that year. Um what do you think happens to him? Because he's had a, a bit of a unique role really. Um as you said in a previous podcast, there was clarity brought to his role a bit I mean, a year into it, maybe 18 months into it, because I don't think everyone kind of knew what he did. He was present in some training sessions on match days as well. And obviously, recently, he's kind of been the link between the academy, hasn't he? He picks out players from youth sessions and kind of promotes them to the first team. And he's kind of that conduit between Eric Ten Hag and the academy. So do you think he's going to stay at the club or possibly leave? What do you think is going to happen with uh, Fletcher's future? I think that's in the balance as well, in that his, his role is still unconventional for a technical director he is still on the training pitch but there is value in terms of him having that insight into which players in the academy would be suitable for a training session when United are short of numbers or there's a an injury in a particular position who from the academy would you bring over and he has that that expertise because he is that conduit between as you said the, the first team hub and the the academy as well and if if a new technical director is coming in, which is probably going to be the case with Wilcox, 
Fletcher's role probably has to change. Would he want to stay on? Uh, his, his two lads are, are there now, Jack and Tyler. They're, they're in the academy. Would he want some distance from that? Uh, that was a conversation he had with them as well before they, they made the move over from City because I think you have to... It's, it's just you know, logical, good parenting advice. You have to make your children aware that you know, of this word nepotism in case they haven't heard it already and that there will be um, at some point down the line possibly accusations made although in, in Jack Fletcher's case he's done very well this season Tyler Fletcher I, I assume is, is has had a pretty significant injury because he, he has barely featured this season but I think I wrote something about Fletcher's role uh, maybe a month or two ago in that it, it was, yeah, there is some uncertainty there, but there's a lot of uncertainty over the futures of, of many um, staff members at United, many players at United as well. I, I think with, in, in regards to the academy and, and Will Cox's possible input there, uh, Nick Cox has to stay. I don't think, of, of all the people that you'd look at and think, yeah, he he's expendable, or he he has to go. Nick, Nick Cox has done a brilliant job at the academy, and he's overseen that for nearly five years now. Oh, it's, it's nobody important. Um, he, he's overseen that for five years now, and you just look at the success they've had at that time. During that time, they've got to the Youth Cup semi final. They've won the Youth Cup. They've produced brilliant players for the first team in in Garnacho and Kobe Mainu. They've been more debutants. They've been some success stories elsewhere, as I mentioned, with, with Ted and Mengi uh, going to Luton. Um, and yeah, so some other players who are having reasonable careers as well. I mean, Charlie Savage was a Wales international. Just but we, we were just talking about there. that in the car last week, weren't we, Samuel? And Rich accused me of sounding like Nick Cox when I said the, the percentage of players that United's academy actually produces that go on to have wonderful careers in the football league. And I say wonderful, they might not be at the top level or what people may consider an elite level, but it's still a fantastic achievement to play in the Championship or League One. And you look at Will Fish, for example, recently who I interviewed, started every game this season for, for Hibernian in, in, in Scotland. So oh, have you? I, you I, might, I, that's not gone live yet, has it? The Will it Smith was interview. two weeks ago, Samuel. So you, 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 you couldn't... You Did you say him. Will Fish? Did you say Will, yeah, Will Fish? Fish, or have yeah, I just correct. Will Fish? I, well, yeah. I apologise. I, I I missed that. I, I will. I'll absolutely have to. I, I was yes. off that two weeks. Ago, fairness, you were. So. You were on holiday, so yeah, I let you I off. Will. But it, it, He's an example, isn't it? And there's obviously this, this championship interest in him yeah. at the moment. Um, but a lot of players go on to have great careers, regardless of whether that is in United's first team or not. It is, and that's that's not going to deter them from yeah, that duty of care. One of the best things they did during the pandemic in 29, uh, 2020 sorry, was that, of course, there was a release list of, of players, but those players were invited back to Carrington to use the facilities to continue training. And United always try and help them find clubs as well, even though these players are, you know, a lot, I mean, other clubs, another several other clubs would just cut their losses and let that be that, shake hands and, and off you go. But United do continue with that duty of care. And I thought that was a really, um, really good gesture, particularly how difficult that time was for everybody. But if you're if you're out of employment, whether you're a footballer or whether you're in another um, another vocation, another another industry, it's it's not going to be pleasant. So to have had that to fall back on would have been very reassuring for those those young players and, and some of those players released at the time have, have gone on to do well. I mean, largely Ramazani is having a pretty good career in, in Spain, I think. Uh, Dimitri Mitchell got a winner for Exeter, didn't he, earlier in the season in, in, in the League Cup. I think it might have been against Luton, in fact. So these, these players are doing quite well for themselves, by and large. Of course, some just you know, fall off the face of the earth. But uh, earlier this season... Um, it was, it was Tyrone who, who went to the, who was invited down when they had um, this day there where Academy alumni were coming back to Carrington and using the facilities and some of them spoke because they, they didn't have clubs at the time for various reasons. I think Rashawn Williams was one of those players and of course he moved to a club, was it Larm or Larn? Um, apologies for the pronunciation to any Irish listeners, but he's of course gone to Belfast as, as everyone knows. Uh, Tom Thorpe I don't think has got a club at the moment and there, there are other players who unfortunately for whatever reason they've um, they've just they've been unattached they've uh, they've been in limbo for a long long time and United still stay in touch with them I think Dion McGee might have been one who 
don't think he's had a club in maybe three years, but he was due to to, to be at Carrington uh, that day earlier in the season. So there's still a line of dialogue there, which I think is again it's, it's very commendable of United that well, you know as as as, as much as we all want to see lots of acad- lots of players in the academy um, in the from the academy in the first team. I think this is a possible, uh, possibly an important message. No, it isn't. Um, I had the same that, message. That, I laughed the, at that. The, as you said yes, that. yeah. The, the the WhatsApp group that we're both in. Normally, when that person messages, it's oh, we, we've got to drop everything and do do a story. But it, it was the absolute opposite in this case. It was uh, very very different. So. Yes, go back to your point. I, I think it's it's good what United's doing. I think Nick Cox has, has cultivated that culture, and um, it, he he cares as well. And he's he's been at United for for about eight years now. I think it is, having been at Sheffield United and and, and Watford before in his career. So I would I'd absolutely be keeping him on, and not not just because he's you know he he can talk until the cows come home when when we do have FaceTime with him. Moving on to pre-season then, Samuel, there was an announcement today, obviously we're recording on Wednesday, that United will play Norwegian side Rosenberg on July 15th. It'll be the first game of pre-season this summer. They'll obviously play in Edinburgh as well, play Rangers, and then they'll fly to the United States again, as, as they did last summer. Um, it's a, it's an interesting schedule because I think last last season's or last summer's schedule was, was scrutinised a little bit because of the load of the putting on the players and obviously we've seen a lot of injuries this season do you think that's a contributing factor because we do understand there has been some concerns in that dressing room over the load in training and inevitably the pre-season schedule does affect that it does and I do think they're in danger of regressing on that in that they're trying to keep too many territories content and uh, the, the, the commercial side is almost uh, overshadowing the football side of it I don't think they need to be going to. I mean, last preseason they literally went to four different countries uh, for, for matches, and uh, with with Edinburgh, that's it's not exactly a trek. But the Norway game that's become a permanent fixture of of preseasons. They they played one there in in twenty seventeen. Mourinho clearly didn't fancy it the next year, so they skipped it. And their European friendly was was in Munich against Bayern, which you'd think well, that's that's well worth well worth your while given you're coming up against a, a good side and playing at the Allianz Arena but since <laughs> since Holly Kondosowski was named manager I think that they've um, they've tapped back into the, the Norwegian fan base and tried to maximise the the, the the spike in interest that they'd have had but of, there's a the huge Norwegian fan base managing Manchester Scandinavia. United Scandinavia as a whole though, there always has been no yeah. of course yeah. there always has been they, they used to go to Scandinavia quite often in in the 90s and the 2000s that they normally they would um, invariably their pre-season tours would be in, in Scandinavia and then it started to be, you know they started to explore the Asian market and they'd tour a lot in Asia and then they started in the United States I think they had a tour there in 2003 and from that point onwards, it was always America or Asia, and in recent years, it's been Australia as well, um, because they they went there in in 2019, and then they went back in 2022 as well. But the problem they have with Scandinavia in terms of touring there is that the the, the stadia is is just not big enough, so you're not going to be selling enough tickets, and of course. European teams don't flock there. The European teams are all flocking to America or Asia because you can play in bigger stadiums, you can make more money out of it. And I don't blame United for that. There has to be... They they need to generate some commercial revenue every now and then. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's maintain, it's ensuring that the football is prioritised. The problem last year was that they started their US tour on the East Coast and ended it on the West Coast, which is illogical just going off the time zone difference. Normally, you start on the West Coast and you work your way back, so you're easing and alleviating any jet lag that the players suffer. I'm sure there are sceptics out there who say, well, why do they need to go to America? Why do they need to go to Asia? And technically, they don't, but you are generating revenue from those trips and they're doing things around those games. And from from our perspective, going on those tours, 
we see people, staff members from Manchester United on those tours that we never see again throughout the whole season because that's that's the importance of the pre-season tours um, to the club. It, it's There are lots of opportunities and I don't think it's a bad thing whatsoever that they're taking um, that they're, they're touring territories and, and putting on games for supporters who might not otherwise be able to get to, to see Manchester United and there's 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 merit in that but the whole thing about that, uh, yeah, but going to Norway that, every year a bit too much of the player Samuel or, or the squad again after seeing such injury problems this season I mean you look at the schedule um, but it's a Norway, short Scotland, tour West Coast East Coast yeah. and it's five games in the space of two and a half weeks and it begins three days after Euro 2024 as well yeah look I think the uh, the, the Norway friendly is the day after the Euros final and, and that, that'll uh, be young squad to be Euros fair Euros final it will yeah. yeah it will that that will look, pick people in Norway they've got to be braced for well I suppose a slightly similar team to the one that turned up in Oslo last year because there were a lot of players still taking time off after playing in international games in the summer and, and other various commitments and so in terms of that friendly uh, if, if you're a Norwegian fan and you want to get a ticket for that game you've got to be braced for quite a, a, a depleted team and Arna will be in it because there there aren't any the, the AFCON has, has come and gone Mason Mount will probably play because the chances are he won't be in the England squad Aaron Wan-Bissaka if he's still a United player could be, could be playing the 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 big draw for that game, quite possibly, could be the new manager, a new manager, uh, not the new manager, if, if if United decide to do that. But I, I do question the wisdom of just keep you know, going to different countries. Um, I mean, if, if with the, the weekend of the Community Shield, if United win the FA Cup and they get to the Community Shield, that's their, their final friendly, their final pre-season game. If they don't, the suggestion is that they will do another two-game weekend, as they have done in the previous pre-seasons under Eric Ten Hag, where they'll play one game at Old Trafford and one game elsewhere, possibly Dublin again, um, which is where they went last year. I think in his first pre-season, the the first game was in Norway and the following day they played in Manchester against Real Vallecano when Ronaldo made his uh, first appearance under Ten Hag and then left before full-time, which was just, just... just another Ronaldo story we had to we had to cover that summer, and uh, of course prompted uh, Ten Hag's immortal "Do your research" uh, advice to, to Simon Peach about five days later at Carrington. But in terms of the, the travelling, they should be limiting it. I I, th- I do question the wisdom of the Norway friendly, but they they have a core fan base there, and they clearly want to keep them happy. They want to go to different parts of Norway. I don't think they've ever played in Trondheim, maybe, or if they did last pl- play in Trondheim, it was a very long time ago. So it's a different part of Norway they're, that they're going to as well. And they've done that a couple of times in recent years since they returned to Norway in 2017, I think it was. And they've been that back there quite often when they've had a pre-season schedule, apart from those in 2020 and 2021, which were yeah, wiped out by COVID. In the 2021 pre-season, it was just... It was just friendlies in England, wasn't it? I think they played Derby, QPR, Brentford and, and Everton, it might have been. It was a bit underwhelming, that wasn't it? <laughs> it's, it's not quite, overseas it's, trips, not quite a, it's not quite New York and, and, and Las Vegas or, <laughs> no, or, or no, Melbourne Los Angeles. Or, and Singapore. Yeah. 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 We'll leave it there for part one and we'll be back in a moment for part two. Welcome back to part two of the Manchester is Red podcast. Now, Samuel, some more bad injury news last night uh, arrived on Tuesday night. Sandra Martinez and Victor Lindelof are set to be out for around a month. Um, Martinez has picked up a calf strain in training. Lindelof picked up a hamstring uh, injury in that Brentford game on Saturday night. He was limping as he walked through the mix zone, so I suspect that he wouldn't be available for Chelsea. It's obviously been confirmed. Um, fortunately, though, Samuel, on the flip side, Ferran, Maguire and Johnny Evans all in training. So that's a positive, isn't it, going ahead to the game against Chelsea on Thursday night? It is. I wrote this morning that Varane was hopeful of being past fit and Ten Hag then, then confirmed that at, um, at his press conference, although they, they were yet to train. So 
know, touch with United say there aren't any more setbacks, but they their training session was after the press conference and I would imagine they'll travel down to Chelsea tomorrow because it's it's such a late kickoff and they, they did that on Saturday and they they had a team hotel that they were able to have a nap. Didn't exactly and, work a, though, did a couple it? of team meetings. It, it didn't. So <laughs> there's every chance that the um the preparations will be will be changed as well. But of course when when there are another space of injuries at United, it's extremely topical because there have been, I think it's now uh, my my spreadsheet has uh, has got it as fifty three separate cases of injury and illness this season that have led to a player missing a game or missing games, which is an extraordinarily high number when we've just entered April, and there is the mitigation there as I've spoken before uh, when I had to do that nonsense of explaining the new Champions League format last week that the backlog of games since COVID is still being felt in the I think at the end of the 21-22 season I was I was on holiday in America and you've got England while I was out there England played three games three Nations League games and that went on into mid-June which was just ridiculous the Nations League should have just been scrapped for that point for, for that um, summer last season was an extremely taxing season because there was a World Cup uh, senselessly held in the middle of it. It was senseless enough to hold it in Qatar. And then, of course, it was always going to have to be played in the winter. And unfortunately, that will probably happen again when the World Cup at some point is held in Saudi Arabia. We've got the Champions League being expanded next season. The world next World Cup is going to be expanded as well. The Euros were expanded in 2016. So there, there are more games in general. And there's not there's not really been a period of of rest. Even last season, it was a long season. It was also a season that ended for United in June. the The FA Cup final was on June third. For Manchester City, it ended on June the tenth. And both of those clubs have had significant injury issues um, in, in 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 recent months throughout this season. So there's that to take into account. But there are also clear issues. At United and Ten Hag doesn't want to say about it. He said he has an idea of what the issue is, and Simon Peach asked him, "Would you like to tell us what that is?" And he just said no today. And I don't think he necessarily helps himself there. I think it it would be good to be transparent with with supporters and with reporters about what could be this main. Um, Although the phrase of that question of all of these issues, the line of questioning could have been uh, a little bit better. There, I say it. Invite him to open well, up a bit more. There you go, just a bit well, of feedback there for our, for our colleague for, in Peach Wish. I'm sure he'll be delighted. He was, yeah. he, was speaking, he was speaking so highly of you earlier today, but I think oh. he'll, um, he'll be keeping a clip around the, the ear next time. <laughs> but uh, but when, you, when you look at the sheer number of injury issues that United have had, and you consider the Martinez case, in September, Martinez got injured against Arsenal. And he's still linked up with the Argentina squad for their, their September internationals. Came back, played two games. United lost both games to Brighton and Bayern Munich. Conceded seven goals. Martinez didn't look himself in either of those games. He then has to have corrective surgery on a metatarsal fracture, and we don't see him again for four months. He, when when it was the internationals last month, Martinez hadn't played in six weeks, and he was allowed to go on international duty with Argentina and train with Argentina in Los Angeles, which. It's, it's 11 hours to get there, so it's a 22-hour round trip to not even play a game. And Argentina had two friendlies. They were friendlies as well. And when, when I mentioned this in September about the wisdom of letting Masters go to Argentina, uh, someone at United, you said, well, it's good for him to spend time with his compatriots, be in that environment. Yes, of course it is. But if Sir Alex Ferguson was the manager that question would not even be asked by Argentina or by, by Martinez. Can I go to Los Angeles, even though I've not played in six weeks? And of course, when he comes back and he's injured quite quickly, United look pretty daft. And I have some some, some sympathy with uh, the manner of his return on Saturday that Varane got injured in the first half, Maguire came on, Lindelof got injured in the second half. So logically... Martinez comes on. They did have the option of Willy Camboala, but if you're taking Martinez in your squad, you've got to be prepared to bring him on should the worst case scenario arise. And unfortunately for United, it did. 
whether it contributes to him then getting a muscular problem, uh, injury, sorry, uh, three days later, only United and Martinez will know that. He only but played that unwritten rule. And at the time though, Samuel, I mean, it, it was a different injury I know. as well, obviously. It was an injury that he was returning from and this was a calf yeah. strain said to be sustained in training. Yeah. Um, and look, I'm, you, this is this is me, you know, kind of like building up to say that th- there's the unwritten rule in football that impact injuries are just rotten luck, freakish more often than not. But muscular injuries are always avoidable. And I, I find it quite interesting that Ten Hag did not bring a fitness coach with him to United from from Ajax or, or, or a Dutch fitness coach. I mean, Jose Mourinho was not a big believer in physiological methods. He was a big believer in playing through the pain barrier, putting your body on the line. But he did bring a fitness coach with him. And Louis van Gaal brought a fitness coach with him in, in Jos, Jos van Dijk in, in 2014. I think it was Carlos Lallin who uh, came to United with, with Mourinho. Under Solskjaer, he didn't. He just, I mean, it was, there was a bit of an old boys club going on there. Um, there were two two um, departures in March 2019, uh, Gary Walker and, and Robin Thorpe from the, the fitness department. And they promoted Charlie Owen from the academy to become the first team fitness coach. And you have to scrutinise, you have to scrutinise his role because he he is responsible for warming them up for going through their paces to ensuring that they've limbered up properly, that they're, they're they're taking the injury prevention techniques. It's not just him. There are other people at the club. You've got a strength conditioning coach. You've got a head of performance as well. And they kit out the players' homes as well so they can do additional work away from Carrington. And a lot of players do uh, work with their own, uh, th- their own fitness staff uh, away from the, the training ground. But it's it's really becoming a big problem for United because it's not just this season that they've had an injury crisis. Um, they were happening; it was happening under Mourinho. It happened under Solskjaer. It happened under Van Gaal. It happened under Sir Alex Ferguson as well. So something is clearly broken, and they've got a new doctor in. Uh, they've Gary O'Driscoll joined from Arsenal in. Uh, I think he officially started in September after uh, Steve McNally was the doctor for. I think he probably was there for 17, 17 years, 16 years, 17 years, something like that. He started in 2006. But really, they've they've clearly stood still where it comes to um, the, the, the medical side of things. I mean, they, they opened a, Tush- a Toshiba Medical Centre at Carrington in 2012 and, and Ferguson hailed it as one of their most important signings. But they still had to conduct medicals elsewhere. That, that was still going on until about seven or eight years ago, I think. And really, there's got to be an overhaul of that department, of the fitness department, of the physiological department, whatever word you want to use, because these injuries have had an adverse effect on on their season, as Ten Hag has not tied in informing us um, in, in recent weeks. And yes, they've had a, they've definitely had a bearing on the results. I don't think you could um, you could ever dispute that. But there are also issues. Some players have have issues with Ten Hag's training methods and uh, the, the demands. Casemiro, remarkably, we we discussed this, didn't we? We looked at it before the Liverpool game. Um, a colleague told us uh, that he he never suffered a muscular injury at Real Madrid. He's been beset by hamstring problems at United this season. He was out for two and a half months with a hamstring problem. He had a recurrence of it, which prevented him from playing against Liverpool in the FA Cup win last month as well. So that's another red flag uh, that has to be considered. And we're, we're speaking at 20 to 3. There'll, there'll be a bit more on um, th- these, these related issues in the embargoed section at, at half 10 this evening.
Going back to Martinez, I don't want to be accused of English bias. Obviously, Luke Shaw um, joined up with England and similar to how Martinez joined up with Argentina, just to be around the camp really and to be around his teammates. But that's a lot more sensible, isn't it? When it's down the road, it's in George's Park um, instead of travelling across the, to North America and to the States. So you can see why why that was kind of given the green light and perhaps it was yeah, necessary th- with Martinez. Yeah, I think the, the, the whole nationality aspect is moot. You've just got to look at the mileage and is... <laughs> Is, is it advisable for an injured player to travel to Los Angeles? No, it's, it's, it's it shouldn't even be a, a question that's asked, never mind uh, permission granted for the trip. But times have, times have clearly changed, though I dispute that. I think any club who apply, are paying a player's wages, if he's injured, he absolutely has to stay with the club. When, when Rangnick came in, he was only interim manager, but he ordered Paul Pogba back from his holiday in Dubai where he was doing his rehabilitation because he was of the opinion that he should be doing his rehab back at Carrington. And he wasn't he wasn't discriminating anyone there. He'd have done it if it was Luke Shaw uh, training in Dubai. And Luke Shaw has trained in Dubai One before. of the best things that Ralph Rangnick did at the club? Maybe Anthony Alanga first. That was his legacy. Is yanking Paul Paul Bobo away from his well, holiday in Dubai? Well, well they're, they're, st- they're still they're still clear enough to train elsewhere. So I don't think um, I don't think a legacy was left there, and I don't think there was a major uh, uptick in Pogba's performances when when he did <laughs> yeah, um, good point. resume playing for United either. Um, <laughs> and let's face it, he's he has not been missed whatsoever. He was actually at the London Stadium um, last night to watch Tottenham West Ham because I'm so ahead. Yes. Yeah, he's obviously banned now from football, isn't he? After the uh, banned substances uh, episode, uh, Chelsea. Then Samuel, um, we all we both agreed that Mason Mount has to start the game. Where he starts, I guess, is the contentious mm. point. <clears throat> um, I would start for Ryan and Maguire at centre half. I've not actually checked your team yet and your panel, but I did read your copy. I've gone. Mm. I've gone he for ten. I've Wan gone for ten out of eleven. So I was I intrigued to ask whether you would take Wan Bissaka. We're, we're one different. We no, no. I've kept Wan Bissaka. Put him at right back. I've, I've kept. I've kept Wan Bissaka in and put him at right back. Yeah. Because I think that extending his stint to left back is is hazardous and Dallow's not. Although he's been his form has been better recently, I don't think it's been compelling enough to keep him at right back. If you've got two full backs and Dallow's more adept at left back, then put Dallow at left back and Wan Bissaka at right back. Um unless unless Ten Hag wants to go with my suggested Anthony experiment from the start. I mean it worked it worked reasonably well against Liverpool, but I still suspect I think, we I, won't I, I see the day said, where he starts a game at left back. Didn't even said piss off when you suggested that to me. <laughs> Politely, I mean, come you on. You did, and then then, then he had his then he had his best then he had his best performance ever for United, <laughs> albeit in very very unique and uh, borderline freakish circumstances. Um, so Mason Mount then Samuel, we'll give him a, a brief nod. I know we kind of discussed it, but would you start him uh, in the number ten role? in his natural position because I'd actually start him on the right I mean Bruno Fernandes probably hasn't done a huge amount to vindicate starting there um, in the last few weeks but I still believe he should play there against Chelsea and then put him out on the wing I, I think that's your your suggestion is logical and my suggestion of putting Fernandes on the right and Mount at um, number 10 we'll is also right, logical yeah. but I, 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 I suspect we will um, we will both be overruled by Ten Hag um just listening to him today, the way he spoke about Mount and said the important thing is that he he keeps fit and he stays fit. I, when when he said that, I thought I can't really see him starting on. on Do you not on think the he looked basis he, he, of that? And he's had he's had two appearances though, and he looked really sharp yes, in Brentford. Like he's he looked, looked good. Physically he's looked fit. bright. Yeah, yeah, he's looked bright. He's he's looked energetic, and he scored a very good goal at the weekend. It was it was a much more difficult uh, chance than than it looked at the time when he got. The ball. I just thought there's only one place this is going, and it ended up in the back of the net. But I think the replay from behind the goal it showed how precise he had to be, and he had a player breathing down his neck as well. It was a very, very precisely taken goal, and very good goal. I also think, you know, if amid doubts whether he has the metal to be a United player, start him against his former club. Don't worry about the hostility that he'll doubtless get if he um, if he rises above it. Then that. That, that vindicates signing him. If you're holding him back, I think that can be. You know, I think that can be um, a, a negative. But as I said, you know, I think Ten Hag is going to be. There are a couple of players coming into this game where 
yeah, if if they get injured, he's he, he's going to get pelters for it. Uh, Varane is one, of course, and I know he told you when he was leaving Brentford that his injury wasn't too bad, um, but he well, he didn't appear in in the training imagery that was released on Tuesday from from that session. And of course, Mount has just come back from a four and a half month layoff, and uh, he's not had a full game. I suppose in, in Mainu's case, when he came back. From from injury, he did start for the uh, under twenty ones in the EFL Trophy. He did start in the youth league as well for the under nineteens. It's a very different level, of course, and and Mount is Mount literally cannot start in in those games. And the days of first teamers appearing in um, reserve games seem to be long gone as well. Unfortunately, it, it would certainly make them more interesting. But there does come a point where you have to just you you want to you want to back up your investment. And they 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 invested sixty million pounds in Mount. It's yeah, you know, it's high time possibly that he starts. And I, I, I that's why I did that piece for for Tuesday morning. Um, I, you, know, you you the way we look at it is that you always want to take it on for that morning read after you know, doing your dust settled piece from from the game at the weekend. And the the logical way to take it on was to um, to consider Mount's uh, position in the team and whether whether this game against Chelsea is the time to start him, and I think it is. But Ten, Ten Hag, as I said, he's he's going to be scrutinised now over the possibility of rushing players back after Martinez returned, technically before the time frame of, of of his layoff that United stated. They said he was going to be out for eight weeks. He he came back seven weeks and six days um, on from from his injury against West Ham. So it is a little bit pedantic, but. I suppose it is just about relevant as well. That said, with Mount, he has been training for what two, three weeks now, probably, probably three weeks. I think uh, since he he came back. I mean, into ironically, team training, he's, so. he's, he's back training on grass in December, and it took so much longer for him to actually return to a, to a match this. But he had a setback. Had didn't he? Setback. Yeah, yeah. yeah so he had, he, well, but, Ten Hag said today he's had three injuries this season. That was the the one in August, the one in November, and then. The, the setback while like, he was out injured. So I think it was two, although he was out for for four months, I think it was two separate injuries um, that contributed to that layoff. You always want to hit the ground uh, running when you join a new club. So it's been such a shame to see him denied uh, to, have to make his mark for injury because at least if he was on the bench and he was fit or you could judge him properly. So it'll be interesting to see what he can actually do in the coming weeks. I can't yeah. actually predict this game, Samuel. I had a strong feeling going down to Brentford that, that somehow cock it up um, because they had momentum. They'd you were right. Pool, and it's just yeah, Manchester United inconsistency. They just go together. But this game, I just I can't seem to figure it out. Um, Chelsea, purely because they're just such a basket case club as well. I mean, Burnley had 10 men uh, at the weekend and they drew 2-2 oh, two. Was a dreadful result Chelsea, yeah. exactly Chelsea were expected to win that um, obviously got to the League Cup final against Liverpool they were brilliant for most of that game and then they just seemed to shrink in extra time and they obviously lost on penalties against Klopp's kids so it's, it's, I can't call it what do you think? And they've, they've been very good against Manchester City in both of their league games this season they got draws in those games they probably should have been 2-0 up at, at the Etihad at half time rather than 1-0 they got a decent draw against Liverpool in their first game of the season, 2-2. So in some of the big games, they have shown you know, glimpses of, of, of what Pochettino would want for them on a far more consistent basis. But there's a reason why they're 11th in the table. There's this nonsense about the underlying stats and Pochettino was jabbering on about it last week, how they should be in the top four, which is complete claptrap. They were no, peddling it's, it's, that it's a, it's a before... Fact, Everton and Chelsea deserve to be in the top four. Champions League clubs. <laughs> the, the, someone clearly from Chelsea was peddling that nonsense on the day of the League Cup final, and he got his, or, or he or she got their just desserts um, when they they lost to a very callow Liverpool side, a depleted Liverpool side in extra time. But I, I agree with you. I, if this game ended 10-10, I, I wouldn't be surprised because it's it's got that potential. When they played each other at Old Trafford in December, Chelsea were, apart from United, they've been the worst team I've seen at Old Trafford all season. Certainly, the the worst uh, visiting side. But, but they're still great chances. Fans were giving them this, exactly. Point of exactly. Time, fans, Sterling should have Their fans gave them pelters at full time, and I think it was it Armando Broya uh, hit the woodwork in 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 added time. So they were, you know, they were a width of a goal frame away from possibly getting a draw. In that that game when United had one of their 
their better games of, of the season, albeit against one of the most dysfunctional clubs, probably the most dysfunctional club in the top flight. United's record at Stamford Bridge in recent years is also very good. They've not lost there since November 2017. Just It's kind of flown under the radar. It used to be the ground where they never, ever won. And since Solskjaer came in as the caretaker manager, uh, he, I think he had three wins there, and they've 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 not lost um, in in their last seven at Chelsea. And Chelsea's record at United um, is is dreadful in general. I think since since the uh, I think it was the October twenty so since and including the October twenty eighteen draw, Chelsea have only beaten them once, and that was in a very forgettable FA Cup semi final in twenty twenty, which was played in front of a soulless and soundless Wembley because of COVID and Ole Gunnar Solskjaer for some inexplicable reason decided to pick a, a team that I remember when I got I got the team sheet quite early on and posted it and Simon Peach almost messaged me to say I think that's a, a wind up that team sheet I don't think it's real he, he, he literally thought it was a joke because of the when amount of rotation you get on this podcast as it. a special guest he, he's he been on it a couple a, of times out of half, a few health but yeah, he, yeah. he gets a fair few shout outs. <laughs> I, I don't disagree. And so apart from that aberration, United's record against Chelsea in the last six years or so has, has been, has been very good. So it should give them some, some hope going there, but I, it's, it's extremely difficult to call. I'm, I'm not a betting man, unlike some others uh, on, on this podcast. So I'll, I'll leave it to them to, uh, to fritter their money away I'm not sure what the odds are so I'll, I'll leave that I'll leave that um, do you know what I'm looking forward to tomorrow Samuel when we make it to uh, I can Bridge? yeah I know what you're going to say you're going to say the, the, the spread in the uh, yeah, Stamford well, you were telling me how good it is you were telling me if it was in a Premier League table that would be at the top and they'd be title winners each week so uh, you've said the they, thing they, they would the yeah they, they would they'd have a longer title winning streak than, um, than Bayern Munich in the Bundesliga I think for uh, for press lounge food they they are uh they're without peer on that front. I'll have to give that a review on Monday's podcast. I believe we'll be back on. So thank you very much for your time, Samuel. You're welcome. Thank you, Stephen. And thanks to listeners as usual. We'll see you after the weekend. Enjoy yourself. Take care.